record. Hey. What's happening, everybody? How are you all today? Doing good. I'm great. I have a history shirt on today. Oh, uh, you got the history shirt. I do. Let me see. Now, unfortunately, in my classes this year, I have not got to teach this yet, but this is Cold War, Cold War Berlin, and you can see the four uh, allied powers that were in control of the city. What do you call that furry thing that's in oh, your arms? This this is my German friend, actually. This is, an, this is Pomeranian uh, number two. Ah, thing two. Thing two. This is thing two. He's the less less annoying, less uh, sociable one. This yes, is what Rusty. What's up, Rusty? Hey, Rusty. Hi, Rusty. Oh, look at me. Come on, look at me. Uh, he's not. He doesn't care. He's not. He didn't look. care. He, he, he could care less about being up here. The other one wanted to be up here the whole time. Yeah. He could care less about being up here. You know, this probably cramps his style, actually. Probably. He could probably have his own YouTube channel and be making money during the quarantine, <laughs> but here he is hanging out with us. So It's a good right, decision, well, Rusty. Yeah, not too bad. We'll see how long he goes. He's a little bit heavier than the other one, so I don't know how long he eats uh, well. on to him. He does. He eats well. He eats first. He's a good guy. Uh, he's a good guy. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, shall we get started? Yeah. Do it. Let me, let me, I'm going to try and move you guys out the way a little bit here. So we're going to start. Today is going to be 41 through 55, and then tomorrow we'll wrap all of them up for everybody. But welcome back. Uh, and here we go with number 41. It says Mestizo Class, created in the Americas, Possession Americas. I know. I, who, I wonder who, why did we put Possession in there? Why are we trying to show Possession, Mr. Farrell? Are we showing possession? Wait, what? <laughs> All right, here we go. Grammar. I'm being that grammar guy. Oh, okay. All right, so uh, mestizo class created in the Americas period to 1450 to 1750. Uh, one of the things that I notice about this course is that uh, a lot of the different periods of time, whether it's period two or period three or even period one, and if we were to teach period four, we would find it there too that um, the, the development of uh, new classes within societies as uh, migrations are settling into particular areas, uh, it has a tremendous demographic and societal impact. Uh, and oftentimes when people are resettled, uh, in the case of like colonies in the Americas or like in period three, uh, you know, the, the settler colonies of the age of imperialism, that you, you kind of uh, have the arrival of a new elite. And oftentimes that uh, uh, status of being elite might have something to do with politics or it might have something to do with you know, economics. And it might have something to do with something that's a little more demographic. What do you guys think uh, kids need to be able to know about uh, the Mestizo class, what it is, why it's important, what, why it's an example of that or how it's an example of that? What do you guys think they should know? All right, uh, mestizo, uh, or in my class, I'll use, also use the term casta, uh, which was the uh, term the Spanish used um, a lot. Um, uh, basically, what we see is, is uh, casta kind of sounds like caste system, right? Because uh, what we see is something similar to that based around race. Uh, essentially, the more European you were, a.k.a. the whiter you were, uh, the more privileged you were in this um, mestizo society that is created as a result of uh, Spanish colonization um, in the Americas. So make sure that you guys kind of understand that uh, this is a result of that. Um, and so what we see is um, racial classification. Um, basically at the top you have your peninsulares who are uh, people uh, that are born from the peninsula or the Iberian Peninsula, right, or Spain and Portugal. Um, and then um, you kind of uh, also have this other group just below the peninsulares who are the most privileged. The group underneath them would be your uh, Creole uh, society. And these are people that are of European descent but born in the Americas um, and, and a, a lot of European uh, descent there too uh, and ancestry. And then, uh, then you have your mestizo, which is your um, uh, person that would have been born in the Americas to maybe someone uh, of Creole descent, and but also probably native descent too. Uh, basically, 
Uh, the more native you were, the more less privileged you were in this culture. Um, and then, of course, uh, if you were born to uh, a, a slave um, or, you know, uh, something like that, you would have been called a, a mulatto, right? If you have both European and, and slave parentage. Um, and uh, then, of course, if you were, uh, you know, uh, born into primarily uh, a native, uh, your mother and father are native, your mother and father are slaves, uh, you would have been at the very bottom, slaves at the very bottom. Uh, so uh, that's kind of the system that is created here as a result of this colonization that happens um, in the early 1500s. Anyone talk about effects, anything like that? I ask you, did you want to chime in on this one? Oh, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, you know, the Mestizo Society obviously is one of blended race and blended heritage. And one thing that, I, that I, my students might recall that we taught about uh, in this particular instance is that uh, oftentimes what dictates one's uh, position in uh, a social hierarchy or in a class system uh, could be, you know, one's wealth. It could be one's, uh, uh, you know, uh, race. In this case, really, it's going to be more race. Uh, but it could be one one's uh, land ownership or, or or tied to wealth, and that could come down to their family and their marital status. Um, and we also talked about uh, how all three of these, wealth, family, and marriage, as well as uh, race, really dictated one's position in society. And so, like with mestizo, uh, in in many cases, if you know uh, a Spanish Creole who uh, was born in Latin America, but was of a, of a privileged uh, family and had wealth, had land, uh, took on a Native American uh, wife and then fathered a, a child with, uh, you know, his, his wife. Um, oftentimes, you know, though racially that individual child would be a mestizo, uh, they were still entitled to a lot of the privileges that, uh, you know, his father or her father would have received being of the uh, Creole, uh, you know, class. Um, but there are also other situations where you may have uh, Creole landowners who ultimately end up fathering children with maybe a female slave that they own. And uh, where there's no regard for marriage, there's no actual marriage, there's no uh, relationship that is developed in, in, in that, uh, in, in that uh, in, as far as a legal term, uh, in that sort of relationship, and so uh, oftentimes, you know, the 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 child born uh, of a uh, free Creole land-owning man and an enslaved African woman uh, would create, you know, uh, a person that would have been uh, racially a mulatto in Latin American colonial times, and in a lot of ways, the race of that child dictated how that child and where that child would be raised as well as the relationship between that Creole man and that woman of African descent. If he chooses to not uh, recognize uh, that, that child as his, uh, and that child's race looks more like uh, the, the enslaved mother, then chances are that child is going to be raised unfree without privilege and raised in a slave order. If uh, that you know, Creole man, uh, land-owning man, uh, decided to uh, take on the, the, the fatherly role and maybe even marry uh, if he was a widower or the situation was there and, and would marry uh, the uh, African slave, enslaved woman uh, that bore his child. Uh, and if the, the, the race was, you know, dark or light, that could have determined, that marriage relationship could have determined how much privilege, uh, you know, that individual mulatto child would have received and where they would have been raised as opposed to being raised in the slave quarters, uh, they may have been raised in the plantation home. And so, you know, one thing that, that we got into was the, the diversity uh, of these integrated social classes uh, within uh, Latin America. And, uh, and so race was now going to be a major, major, major point of emphasis on one's status in society. Did anybody else want to chime in on 41? I'm good. We're good? Yeah. All right, let's keep moving. Okay, 42, the middle passage is established. And we also have this for period two. Farrell, you want to start off? Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, one of my very favorite uh, things that I like to show students in the year is uh, the Slate, I think is the name of the website or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have that interactive map that you can click on and it really shows, you know, the amount of, of, of slave ships that were crossing this middle passage, but also it shows uh, who is doing, is, is involved in the slave trade, but it also shows where they're going too. Those are kind of the three things I like my kids to kind of know about this middle passage. Um, and by the way, guys, um, if you Google search, like it, go on Google and, and, and do slate African slave trade. Well, you know yeah, what I do? I'll put, the, I'll put the link. I'll put the link out there for everybody too. Cool. Uh, and they can access that. Um, it's a powerful, powerful thing uh, to see. Uh, but anyways, um, but the middle passage, obviously, this is that uh, the, the, the middle journey, right, of that kind of triangular train across the Atlantic that we see. Uh, of course, the, the first passage um, would be the goods from uh, Europe, usually manufactured goods in the form of like firearms, generally from Europe to Africa. Uh, they would unload those ships uh, in Africa uh, and then reload those ships with um, these African slaves. And then, and then they would send them across the Atlantic to, uh, you know, various different places, Brazil, the Caribbean, North America, uh, unload those slaves, then reload them with American goods like rum, usually sugar, tobacco, uh, all, all, you know, uh, American goods. And then, uh, they would send those goods back to Europe. So it kind of made this kind of triangular trade, right? Well, the middle passage is that there's African slaves that are being brought from Africa to the Americas. Um, and obviously, you know, what is it? 12 million, I think is the number, uh, African slaves that are brought to the Americas. That doesn't include the amount that died on the middle passage. Um, another, another great resource is uh, to read a lot of Equiano uh, and uh, a primary source, a guy that actually experienced the journey. And that's the one thing we don't have very many people that um, survived that journey that were literate and could read and write. So a lot of Equiano was a rarity for us. He was somebody who gave us a, a, a firsthand account of the, the, the horrors that went on on, on these ships. Um, people are just, I mean, these are human beings that are being crammed into these ships. They're being, you know, sent across for you know, weeks, sometimes months on end uh, with just absolutely the worst conditions. I always tell my students, I mean, if you can think of hell on earth, the worst situation you could possibly be in other than having to sit in a Mr. Millette's lecture. But anyway, uh, but the absolute worst situation that you could be in would be this. I mean, I, I literally couldn't think of any worse situation at all. Um, and, um, but anyways, uh, so that's kind of the middle passage. Uh, and of course, like I said, this is what's going to uh, bring 12 million slaves uh, in a span of 300 years, you know, less than that, um, 250 years, uh, which is just unprecedented. It's, it's absolutely insane. And like I said, if you go to, if you Google search that, that, uh, that website, um, man, you can really see that. Kasky, do you want to chime in? Sure. I think there's a lot of different things you can talk about the Middle Passage. Uh, one of the main things, obviously, is the effect of this. You can talk about the effects in Africa itself with the detrimental pulling of all of the young men. Um, they were one of the primary uh, peoples that are going to be taken, and that's going to wipe out an entire generation for Africa and having long-term consequences, changing social structures, governmental structures, military structure. You're going to have the effects then in the Americas, uh, obviously in uh, what will become, you know, the United States. Uh, you'll have effects uh, in the Caribbean. And then one that Mr. Farrell talked about that, you know, I emphasized to my students and we looked at the map was that where did most of the slaves go? And we always have that U.S. centric viewpoint. And when you, you refresh your memory that the map showed that most of the slaves actually went to uh, the Brazil, South America, and the Caribbean, not to the United States, even though we, we think of, you know, ourselves as the great evil of this um, because of our own problems with slavery and, and the South, uh, really that, that's a telling tale of 
what goods they wanted. Um, and while we try to emphasize tobacco and, and King Cotton, uh, really it was the sugar, rum, and resources from the Caribbean and South America that they wanted. Uh, you talk about this economically. Uh, you could talk about it environmentally. I always like to share the fun fact with my students, and they always find it fascinating that shark migration patterns literally change because the amount of bodies that they're dumping overboard mm. uh, because they're they're packing them in three and four hundred uh, living people into a ship that's only supposed to carry a hundred. Uh, they're putting them in there like spoons, like you would silverware. And that's what they call a stacking the spoons. And the, the loss of life is just tremendous. And as he said, only about 12 million make it alive, but it's estimated anywhere. Again, we don't know the figures exactly because so many of the ships were lost and crashed. Um, they have bad and, records too. What's well, that? The records are the ones that bad. were smuggled illegally yeah. after the slave trade you know yeah. were, were, were abo was abolished in certain countries the numbers yeah. i mean 50, 50 to 100 stories, million we'll never know that act the yeah. accurate number yeah they, they estimate you know anywhere it could be from 50 to 100 million people were pulled out of out of africa at the time period and that has a lot of different effects on on every everyone and that you know is just economic and social you're not even talking about the the moral uh you know harshness i mean that this creates with these you know people's lives um and then you you have uh some positive things like alando equiano um you know learning to read and coming out of this and then you have you know the, the amistad uh is an example of the one successful because a lot of students always ask like why didn't they fight back there's so many more than them and you can get into the details about the the stories that we do know of they were chained uh they were locked in uh you know almost uh, different pockets where they wouldn't allow people to have the same languages to be near each other. So they couldn't communicate because if you don't speak the same language, how are you going to fight back? How are you going to coordinate your efforts? Um, there, there's a lot of good videos out there of this, you know, of, of trying to replicate what it was like, you know, the hell on earth for these people on the boats, um, you know, with dancing the slaves, you know, where they took them up and then they tossed, you know, they've been laying in their own filth, you know, peeing and pooping and vomiting all over themselves. And then when they take them up out, you know, into the daylight, the horrible things that they do to them, uh, you know, throwing the salt water on them and try to clean them and they have sores all over their bodies. Uh, it, it just, it, you can't imagine. And I used to do an activity a long time ago, probably couldn't get away with it anymore, where I would make students get underneath tables and we would tape out and mark off, you know, the amount of space each person would have. And I'd say, just sitting for five minutes now being, Imagine being in this for like months at a time. It, it, it is unfathomable what these people suffered. And then it even gets worse, uh, you could argue, when they finally make it to their final destination. Yeah, that activity would be really bad when you ask them to use the bathroom right there. You, know, you definitely wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> Probably get in some trouble nowadays. Probably. All right, Back in the 90s, it was okay. Yeah. yeah, even in the 90s, I'm not so sure. Yeah, the 90s was anything goes, that's for sure. Well, I, I would like to say uh, just a couple of things. Um, yeah, the, the one thing I, I tell my students is, you know, when, when you go and, and you think about what people understand about uh, people moving to the Americas during this period of time, uh, oftentimes what, you, what we've learned in elementary school, and this is not a knock on elementary teachers or anything like that, but what is typically learned is that, you know, uh, coming across the Atlantic Ocean was, was something that people were doing uh, in the name of religious freedom or free, uh, fleeing from uh, political oppression or, or some level of oppression. Well, you know, the harsh reality is that in the 1700s, and especially the latter end of the 1700s, from about 1750 to 1800, uh, more people were coming from Africa and uh, were, were being taken to the, the, the settler colonies uh, than there were Europeans coming. Uh, and so when you really start looking at it, um, in, that, uh, in that very intense period of time uh, where the African slave trade and the crossing of the Middle Passage was at its height, uh, it, it's, it's actually a complete opposite. They're, they're coming against their will. They're coming unfree. They're coming bound. They're coming fettered. They're coming cuffed. They're coming in the, in the conditions that you all have just described. And it really, you know, a lot of things that we oftentimes take as, as sort of a, a universal truth about history uh, really, really doesn't uh, speak for the whole, the whole uh, experience across the Atlantic Ocean. And another thing I find interesting too, one of you mentioned about the moral aspect of uh, slavery during this time. 
and it's it, it still baffles me even today and it'll probably baffle me the rest of my life and and and, and career as a history teacher but it's that when the uh, slave trade and, and the middle passage is it's is most highly trafficked uh, with African captives uh, who are going to be sold in slave auctions at the coasts uh, of their uh, of their destinations is at the exact same time by the exact same people uh, who are you know uh, purveying enlightenment idealism about you know equality and uh, you know fraternity and uh, you, you know, the, the rights of property and, and natural rights and, and all things like this. And yet at the same time, they're, they're not looking beyond uh, clearly this, this uh, you know, this, this system of slavery. Um, and it really, to me, it really tells the tale of just how much dehumanizing took place in the 18th century, uh, that all of these wonderful ideas were just simply not going to be applied and that is one of my, my biggest, uh, you know, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, issues I take with the 18th century. Yeah, uh, in this, in this, age, yeah, in this age of enlightenment, you know, and personal freedoms, it only really applied to a specific few, you know. So yeah. No, I always look at that, and and, and I, I say that as a way to sort of contextualize this because uh, even though there are these things that are happening around the world. Uh, that didn't mean that that all all things were were progressing and all things were enhancing and all things were changing for the better. Uh, some yeah, things yeah. were unfortunately still business as usual, even the bad stuff, the harsh reality stuff uh, of life in the 18th century. Yeah. All right. Are we good with 42? And, and, and last thing I'll say is on the AP exam. Now I know this is going to be a very untraditional uh, AP exam. But man, the College Board, this is a big thing. They love students understanding migrations, especially forced migrations. And this is the biggest example of forced migration in all of history. So remember remember this stuff, guys. And, and with that, uh, the uh, one thing you could put on there too is that we didn't mention uh, them being forced by themselves. Remember, one of the biggest purveyors of slavery on the Africans people were the Africans themselves. And I talk yeah. a lot about that. And we talked about some of the specific tribes that would sell their own people to save their own skins, or they would sell other tribes to make sure that their tribe was, you know, not uh, taken advantage of. Yeah. And let's face it, it was lucrative for them. You yeah. know, they made a lot of money off it. And I mean, really ultimately what makes the world go round, you know, why do we do what we do? You know, everybody's trying to make money. You know, and I always tell that's one of my things. And anytime we come back to something, I was like, what does it always come back to? And they always, always, always yells money. <laughs> it always is. I mean, almost everything in history, almost every movement, everything that happens, that is kind of one of those guiding things. So in this well, case, move, that, that was it. Let's move on to 43. I've got yeah. money riding on 43. Oh, yeah? Is it Coca-Cola? I don't uh, know. I don't know what it is. Oh, here it is. Oh, <laughs> I was <laughs> like, what? I got it. Wow, I was going with your, your claim that we yeah. everything we yeah. do is for money. What? Sorry, I was talking to my son. That's okay. You can watch the YouTube video. <laughs> there we go. Millions of Asian and European migrants moved to the USA, North America. What is it with migrations, folks? I, I feel. Is, I mean, is this really that important in world history? Is migrations really that important in world history that we've got to understand? Millions of Asian and European migrants are moving to the USA and North America. Does this really matter? Very I coming up so often. I, I mean, is it possible that they could be tested on something like this? I mean, <laughs> I turn like I just said the something. curriculum and I see everything about migrations. I don't get it. I, I guess it's I guess it's an important part of things. I, I don't know. Um, yeah. I, okay. Enlighten me, guys. I'm I'm lost. Yeah. So, like I just said, uh, migrations are important, right? Uh, not just African migrations, but also we're seeing European uh, and Asian migrations as well. Um, now, this is more of a period three thing. Now, do we see Europeans moving to the U.S. North American period two? Yeah, we do, right? But um, a big difference here now is uh, a lot of Asians are starting to move uh, in period three. And um, I'll do the Asian migrations if you guys want to do the European migration. That's fine. Okay. So uh, Asia, um, uh, I'm going start, to start with China. So China, because that's kind of the biggest one we're talking about here. So 1800s, 
you know, seven, um, even late 1700s, China's going through a lot of changes. You know, the opium wars. Hold on one second. Hey, guys. You got to be quiet. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, but. Uh, <laughs> right, hang on one second. One second. <laughs> okay. Pomeranians. Pomeranians. Just, just lay there and do nothing. Continue to lay there and do nothing. Thank you. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the China, through the opium wars and China, you know, the, the China deals with that, uh, the Tanzama, I'm not Tanzama, the Ottoman empire, the, uh, Taiping rebellion, um, you have the Boxer rebellion later, um, you know, China's going through a lot of, of, of stuff. Uh, also then you have natural disasters, earthquakes and famines in the 1800s. Uh, the Chinese, many Chinese people, they're, they're looking for a way out. They, you know. And uh, United States offers them that. Uh, you know, in the U.S., they're moving west, and what are they finding? They're tapping into gold. And there's, there's news uh, going into China that there's uh, all kinds of, of gold that is available in, in the United States. And so we start to see that uh, begin to happen. Of course, the Chinese get there. They realize there's not much gold left, but there is a railroad that is being built. Uh, and uh, many of them will uh, hop on and uh, start working on the um, but uh, so that's just one example of uh, Asians migrating to, to the North America. Um, many, many migrants came to the, to the U.S. or North America um, for many reasons. Um, hold on again. If you guys want to take over, I've got to go deal with something. So let me let me talk about um, kind of this uh, generally. And then I think you can get into some specifics, Mr. Mollett, since the year the Euro guy. Uh, so when I taught this, I always look at it and I say, all right, we need to remember back to our human geo terminology that there are the push and pull factors. And we, we went over in my class push and pull factors that in, in Europe and in Asia, uh, in Europe, we have all of these push factors that would drive the Europeans to want to go somewhere else. The grass is greener on the other side. So the things that, that my students always come up with uh, you know, are going to be war going to be famine, going to be religious persecution, things of that nature, negative stuff happening to them in their lives. Uh, you know, crime, uh, the, the horrible pollution in the city, so on and so forth are going to be those push factors. And then in North America, for the Europeans, there were a lot of pull factors for them. Uh, land is more abundant, uh, the, the rise of, of more freedoms, not living under the rule of a king or a queen. We don't have titles. Um, not being beholden to what your family's heritage is. If your dad was a blacksmith, you had to be a blacksmith. If your dad was a cobbler, you had to be a cobbler. You were stuck in those ruts there. And in America, the idea of the American dream is starting to be born uh, and that people have the ability to make their own destiny. And as we enter into the manifest destiny, people are able to uh, uh, live types of lives that they want, the freedoms that go and do what they please. And so you have these, these pull factors of gold and land and choosing your own destiny, uh, jobs, money, uh, food, riches, galore. And I think that that is something. Also, uh, just getting away from your family or getting out of jail. A lot of times these are debtors that, you know, they're given a choice. Be like, hey, you can stay here and rot in jail or we're going to send you away. And they're like, all right, I'll take my chances. Yeah, you know, for seven just, years. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, a partial indentured servitude or working as a cowboy in the Midwest. Uh, you know, and they, they sell it pretty well to uh, a lot of the companies we have incorporated here as well. We talked about, you know, the, the joint stock companies. They're trying to entice these people to come over because we need workers. Uh, and this is one of the rare cases in, in, in history where there are more jobs than there are people. And the United States in particular needs workers. Mexico needs workers and the Caribbean needs workers as well. Um, another thing I wanted to add too, which by the way, push pull factors, really, really good. I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, we definitely covered that in my class too. Um, but one thing I want to mention too is, uh, you know, look at the time period, guys, industrial revolution, you know, and with uh, industry is going to allow them to move uh, to faraway places, you know, the steamship, the railroad. I mean, these are all things that are going to allow them to move uh, and migrate to far away places, to whole new continents. Whereas before that, maybe it really wasn't an option for, for many people. Industri industry is going to allow them to do that. So I wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, those are all great points. And, and you know, you mentioned that I teach European history. And one of the things I teach 
in European history, especially in the latter part of the 1800s is, you know, for a lot of Europe, um, especially like Northern Europe, uh, they're, they're actually going through a second industrial revolution at that point where, you know, things are actually pretty good for people compared to say like, you know, the, the early first industrial revolution, uh, workers' wages are going up. Uh, the cities, although they are uh, continuing to deal with overcrowding and uh, trying to absorb uh, this large urbanization that's going on in Europe, uh, some of the cities are being uh, reconstructed. Uh, some of the, uh, you know, the, the streets are, are being widened. The boulevards are being widened. Some of the old buildings are being knocked down and new buildings are being erected that are, are made with... Um, you know, instead of being made of wood, uh, they're being made with, you know, with steel and, and, and iron, uh, you know, things like this, and it's, and it's safer. Uh, the cities are really developing uh, ways to absorb larger populations, but as much as they're doing that, they can't absorb all uh, of Europe's uh, population. And even though by the early 1900s, more than 50% uh, of Europeans will live in towns and cities, uh, that didn't mean that they could absorb all of the all of the movement from rural to, to urban locations. And so uh, in a lot of ways, uh, when you literally have tens of millions of Europeans over several decades uh, moving away from a place that is as progressive and as developed and as industrialized as a lot of Europe was, especially Northern Europe, um, it goes to show that that maybe not everything was so great in Europe many people were looking to uh, to get out of Europe specifically. And the other thing I would say is uh, I always like to look to comparisons because I think comparing things like migrations of Europeans and Asians to the USA or to North America and comparing it with other uh, settler migrations at the same time. Uh, for example, North America, though they're going to receive a lot of uh, migrants from Europe and Asia, not only ones. Uh, we see a lot of European as well as Asian migrations moving into South America and parts of the Caribbean during this period of time. A lot of people think industrial revolution, industrial revolution, industrial revolution. That's all well and good. But agriculture in Latin America was still so big during this time, and with the slave trade and slavery ending, uh, a lot of Asian migration, uh, as well as you know, Southern European migration into South America, uh, picked up uh, a lot of the, the need and demand uh, for agricultural labor. Uh, for example, it was not uncommon for Italians to move to Argentina, especially uh, those from southern Italy, to take on agricultural work. And then they go back to, to southern Italy when the season was over. And they Galandrinas. Uh, yeah, the, the swallows, as they were called. Because uh, they're migratory. Asian migrations um, in, in the British imperial system. The British imperial system was big in the, the, the enforcing of the slave trade being abolished, but the British imperial system was also responsible for bringing millions of people from South Asia to other parts of the world, including parts of South America, like where British Guyana would be established. Uh, and so you would also see uh, a lot of people from Asia uh, going to um, Australia during this time and, and, and dealing with uh, issues of nativism and racism there. Uh, how about uh, uh, how about India to like Carib uh, Caribbean uh, areas like Trinidad? Hey, oh, Mr. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or even or even South Asian peoples being resettled in South Africa, uh, yeah. which was a British colonial uh, sed uh, settler colony as well. Uh, and and then uh, yeah, on top of that, you have Europeans that are also moving to those places and the English moving to those places. And one thing that I I also like to look at is the effects of. Uh, these migrations. It diversifies uh, the United States and North America. It diversifies these other settler colonies. It diversifies them racially, uh, demographically, socially, and in so many different ways. Uh, it's the a lot starting of the melting pot. We will see that. And, and yeah. what we have here is, again, a lot of the laborers that are doing this, many of them are labor migrations. Many of them are males. And uh, that's going to have, uh, you know, demographic and gender impact uh, on where they are received and from where they are uh, originating or where they are leaving from. Uh, they are also establishing, especially in the cities that they're coming through in the United States and, and even in Canada during this time, uh, specific ethnic enclaves, uh, Little Italy, Italy's, um, you know, uh, China Irish town. communities, Chinatowns. And a lot of these people are going to be uh, subjected to nativism and racism 
and ethnocentrism and distrust and oftentimes uh, would be regarded as uh, you know second class citizens or, or the you know the, the immigrants are 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 beneath them. Um, that was a very real issue, and even some of the governmental policies of the time, uh, you could see that 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 discriminatory action was taken uh, against a lot of these immigrant uh, settlers. All right. Yeah. Anything else you guys want to say on forty three? That's pretty good. All right, we will move forward. We will push forward. Ah, oh, you I set it I up. Know. I knock it down, I, dude. I, I, there are these like little things that I can trigger you with. Yeah, and that was one of them. <laughs> it's a good right, movie, so man. The Mughal Empire founded. Now we mentioned. I know in the first, um, I think it was the first video we did. We talked a little bit about um, Akbar and the Divine Faith, and this is about when the Mughal empire was founded and that's a period two one i know in my class uh we studied i want to say six uh land-based empires between 1450 and 1750 and the mughal empire was one of them uh and so when kids uh think of of land-based empires in uh in this time period i hope that this is one that comes to their mind pretty quickly we looked at a lot of primary sources a lot of mughal artwork and architecture uh, to really get the understanding of what, uh, you know, religious and political uh, developments were like for the Mughal Empire. Um, but yeah, it was one of our, our, our six that we did, if I can remember all six of them, we had the three gunpowder empires that we did, so the Mughal being one of them, the Ottomans and the Safavid Empire, so those were three, and then I believe we did the Ming and Qing Dynasty collectively, that was four, uh, I had my kids look at the uh, Russian Empire, the, the Romanovs coming to power mainly, uh, and that was five. And then we also did a little bit with the Songhai Empire, so that was six. Oh, I, I, wow. I, I, my hope is that when kids think of those land-based empires during this period of time, that this is one of them that comes to them. Uh, what do you all think they need to know about the foundation of the Mughal Empire? Uh, obviously, this is, like you said, it's a gunpowder empire, so... Uh, it was founded upon the the introduction of gunpowder to them. So, um, and it was right around 1450 when this happened. So, um, you know, uh, after the 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 Mongols uh, kind of declined, there creates this power vacuum uh, in this region, and uh, so creates this kind of available space to build an empire. Uh, and the uh, Mughal, uh, they do. Um, and, um, you know, you kind of mentioned a, a lot there uh, as far as uh, geography. But, yeah, I mean, this is in India. Uh, it's going to last into period three, of course, with the Sepoy Rebellion and then the eventual British colonization. So, um, yeah, that's, two, that's – uh, Two of the main things that we talked about were uh, religion, that the Mughals are Muslims oh, yeah. and they're ruling – um, the subcontinent of India, and most of those people are Hindu, as we've mentioned many times before. So that was a unique uh, blend of culture and religion, and they were pretty peaceful. There wasn't a lot of fighting going on. Mughals were one of the rare exceptions of acceptance of another religion, and that was uh, that. I think that was really important. Um, so that was that was one thing that we went over was the religious aspect. Yeah, I, I did. I did a lot of the same too. We we really looked at um, how the different uh, leaders uh, of the early Mughal Empire, uh, you know, oftentimes changed their policies. You had some that were, uh, you know, very uh, vehemently um, proponents of Islam. They were personally Islamic, and they wanted to see more of the public um, uh, uh, sort of state sponsorship of Islam. Uh, yeah, and you see that in the architecture that they sponsored. Uh, and but the also had those that were more like religiously tolerant uh, and not that they didn't upplay Islam, but, but, you know, they, they tried to remove, you know, like additional the taxes caste system. on, uh, yeah. They you know, tried they to push the away. The system that was still there, but they would remove uh, certain, uh, you know, taxes that were on uh, non-Muslims and, and you would see this greater level of tolerance and, and sharing of privilege uh, that, you know, other leaders before and after Akbar uh, either did not do or return to doing, uh, you know, and, and it made for a, it made for an interesting empire, um, to say the least. 
you know, the Mughal Empire is also in power in India when Europeans are starting to uh, take a very, very interesting approach to India. They're wanting to get into the, the coastal areas. They're wanting to get involved in the market. They're wanting to get involved in the, in the spice market and the cinnamon market and, and uh, to an extent the cotton market uh, because it was big in India during this time. Um, and the Mughal are there and, and really kind of depending on the leadership uh, at the time of the arriving Europeans, uh, kind of determine just how much the Europeans would be allowed in. Uh, another thing I, I did is a lot of contextualizing of the Mughal. Like Mr. Farrell mentioned, you know, when the Mongols uh, lose power, there's a, there's a power vacuum in a lot of the places that they were once, you know, uh, in charge of. And, and not that they were in charge of India, uh, but you do have these Mongolian and Turkish uh, resettlement patterns that happened. And uh, right there in India, uh, you're going to have, you know, the, the people that, that say that they were descendants of the Turks and descendants of the Mongols uh, come to control, uh, you know, what is essentially the better part of South Asia. Um, I, I taught the same way. That, that's why China went the direction it went with the uh, rise of the Ming and the Qing dynasties. When you have these, these period one, uh, land-based empires fall. Uh, you had this, uh, a riot, you know, this, uh, this sort of arriving of uh, new land-based empires, new political elites that were coming in to, uh, in to control these areas. And Mughal uh, is going to be one of those. I, we did the, uh, those big pictures you had to take down for me, Mr. Millette. Those yeah, were the all topsy. Yeah, the, uh, we did the autopsy activity and it was very successful. And the one that was done really, really well by Trey is, um, uh, I think, I think he's the one that drew uh, Akbar the Great from this time period. Oh, and hold tight, hold tight real quick here about Trey. Trey probably won't be able to see this because he, he probably hasn't found his phone over the last three months. Uh, that's kind of an ongoing joke we have in, in seventh period Euro. But Trey, if you're able to see this and hear this, that was an amazing picture that you drew, by the way, buddy. Yeah, I'm pretty sure his group had the, he, he, his group had the Mughal and he drew Akbar the Great. Oh, it was phenomenal. I, I, he brought it in my class and I saw it. And then, of course, I saw it in your classroom hanging up. It, it was, he's, the kid's, the kid's very talented. For sure. very hey, talented. Can, I sh can I show you guys something real quick? It looks like I have a halo on top of my head right now. You guys see that? Now, what would they call that in art history? Well, what, do you, what are you talking about? Like when they use illumination over so it, light. It usually means something is like divine. Oh, that's not you then. Well, it's very me. Look at that. I mean, you can see I've got like a little halo there. If I but isn't that isn't that an I art see little devil horns? Where, 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 that's a halo. Where you can see, I just see illumination. I see light. It's a halo, halo, halo. Uh, isn't that called 45. like five? Uh, no singing Kira, today. Forty-five. Kira, Kira, Kira These videos, they're not a video without at least me singing at least once and me uh, eating. Right. All right, all right. Onward to forty-five. Are we to the to end forty-five. Yet? I got it like, Slams. there we go. Hey, Napoleon's Napoleon. reign. Speaking of Euro, huh? Yeah. All right, well, Napoleon's reign, that's going to definitely happen in this period of time. It's happening really towards um, around the 1800 mark, uh, where the French Revolution has, um, you know, uh, gone, has gone for over a decade uh, by the time he comes to power or, or very close to that decade. Gone and, awry. Uh, really, he is, he's going to be sort of the end result. Uh, of some of the revolutionary changes. I, I, in, my, in my Euro class, I teach a lot about Napoleon. In my world class, he, he, he gets a little bit of a mention, but uh, really what, what, I, what I teach in my Euro class about Napoleon is uh, really there's two sides to him. You know, he is this, in many ways, this product of the French Revolution and this product of the Enlightenment. And in some of his policies when he comes to power, you can see that, that he is a champion of the Enlightenment. But then uh, you also see when he comes to power that as much as he is that, he's also this other this sort of two-faced individual where uh, he is, you know, a, a traditionalist and uh, is a military dictator and is expansive and wants to expand and, and, and control and take over and, and do all these things as well. Um, he's, a, he's one of the most dichotomous people uh, in, in, in world history and certainly in European history as well. Uh, what do you all think for world history kids? What do we need to understand about Napoleon and Napoleon's reign? Well, I'll keep it short. <laughs> Did it you like that? Well, of course, of <laughs> got to work on your dad jokes there. <laughs> I don't even have kids and my dad jokes are better. Listen, listen. 
That hey, was not only a dad Mr. joke. Phil can do one thing. He can keep things short. <laughs> <laughs> Man, well, you know. Um, I'll, I'll say that was not only a dad joke. It's a history joke all in one. So. Oh, okay. 5-11. 5-2. Not 5-2. Five 5-2. Two. Five two. I saw two, two, two fingers. That's 11. That, two fingers makes two. When you hold up two fingers, that makes two. I learned that in pre-K. So All I think right. for world history, Napoleon uh, know the, the ramifications of this. So the Napoleonic Wars, uh, and we learn the great lesson that you never, ever, ever invade Russia during the winter. <laughs> um, that no one seems to learn. Nobody seems to learn that. Um, so, and I always teach that to my kids. If you guys are going to become, you know, world dictators someday, evil masterminds, never invade Russia during the winter. Um, and I, I think that, uh, I think you look at this a lot of militarily, how we're still at this time period stuck in those old battle tactics. Um, you're seeing very little, uh, evolution in military, and it's kind of the same old song and dance that France has been through before trying to assert their dominance over Europe. Uh, and, and Napoleon, I think, is a great example of absolute power corrupts absolutely. Because uh, I think he had genuine concern for his fellow Frenchmen and, and the people as a whole. I think he had good intent from the beginning, but it, it, it got to him, as it does many leaders and rulers. So. Well, Kasky stole what I was going to say. Good. <laughs> um, I guess if I if I had to to, to also add to things that I think uh, Napoleon would have been important for as far as world history is concerned, uh, is Napoleon and really the French Revolution and then Napoleon's reign uh, really inspired a lot of French nationalism and the ability to to for a uh, can't hear you, Millet. I said it inspired he a lot. Froze. Of you froze. Okay. You're right. You got to pay your bills, man. Oh, and he's the one recording, too. I wonder if it stopped recording. Oh, oh. now you're frozen. Let me text oh, him. Kasky, you look great with the freezing there. You guys got to see this. This is awesome. <laughs> it's a funny this face, is still though. recording. This is too funny. Okay. Kasky, if, <laughs> if you froze. Yeah, but then you froze. My stuff finally came back. You froze, and you had what? this look on your face. I swear, I hope it's on the video. <laughs> <laughs> your no, face is on the video. Too. Real bad. All right. So what I was saying is, uh, the French Revolution and then also Napoleon's reign inspired a great deal of French nationalism, uh, okay. and also uh, that nationalism uh, created a situation where French citizens, especially the men. Right, felt a uh, felt a a personal connection to the state. Uh, and it's like Gator fans, you know the the oh I, I'm a Gator, I'm a Gator fan, and I feel that personal connection to being a Gator fan. That's kind of what was happening here. Is that the Frenchmen, you know, they really connected to that nation and that government and that military. They were conscripted into the military. They were they were a part of it. They all played this this civic role. They they were citizens, not subjects. And, 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 and that government was something that they had a hand in and something that they were attached to. And of course, what Napoleon does is he takes his military and goes throughout all of Europe. He beats up on Spain, he beats up on Portugal, he beats up on Italy, he beats up on Austria, he beats up on Prussia, he beats up on Russia. Even though he ultimately loses in Russia, he still did a lot of beating up on Russia. That wasn't exactly a great time to, 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 to be under French occupation, uh, the experience of the Russian people. He takes shots at England, and even though it mainly fails against England, he's still uh, somebody that they have to deal with. He's got to, they got to deal with the, the French Navy and the blockade and all this. So what Napoleon does is he goes around and he makes so many enemies in Europe that they are going to have their own inspiration of nationalism. That there's going to be this, this, you know, uh, uh, this ownership that uh, the people in Russia and the people in Portugal and the people in Spain and the people in the different Italian states at the time – they're going to connect to, uh, you know, at least an idea of a national movement or to an actual nation that may have pre-existed in that time, and part of that nationalism in those different European locations, in many ways, was going to be a hatred for the French and a desire to not allow the French to be able to do this again, and that's why they treated Napoleon in France the way they did when he's finally defeated uh, there in the early 1800s. And so I look at him as one who really moved toward 
and influence the development of the different uh, uh, forces of European nationalism uh, during this period of time. Yeah, I find it interesting that it was nationalism that that rallied, you know, uh, France, and it was nationalism that ultimately also broke up his empire. So it can it can be your friend and it can be your enemy. That's right. That's right. All right. So I think that's pretty good on Napoleon's reign. What do you guys think? Yep. Yeah, I don't think the kids need to know a lot with him. Uh, so yeah, that's, Euro, more than that's a different story. Euro, they need to know Napoleon. You know what's yeah. funny though? Uh, even in Euro, I don't see them asking a whole lot of questions about Napoleon. But right. a lot of things that that happened during his, his reign two and period three in my class for Euro is going to come back to is you can always bring something up about Napoleon. All right, here we go. Forty six. <laughs> well. Well, All right, I mean, 47. Do, do we need to go over that again? Uh, I mean, we've, we've gone over it quite a bit uh, in, in these videos. Um, let, let's do this. Let's think of three things that, that would be most important for kids that they would need to understand about nationalism. Uh, I'll start. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. yep. Okay, I was not sure if you froze up again. Oh, All no, right, I froze. Uh, <laughs> you just froze, actual. Um, no, uh, so, uh, and again, <laughs> yeah, and again, nationalism is a, a really big ideology you need to know. Uh, so to reiterate that again, I mean, you can see how many times we've discussed it over the course of these, uh, of, of, of this assignment, this, this whatever we're doing. Um, but uh, so nationalism, um, you know, whatever we call recalling this review, um, but no, nationalism, like we kind of just said, um, nationalism inspires. Um, it, it rallies people around something that they previously didn't have. Um, you know, before people identified with a family or a city, you know, I, like for example, Leonardo da Vinci, right? His last name is, is, is taken from the city that he lived in, which was Vinci, right? Uh, so, and, and by the way, that's a lot of people's last names are derived from the city they lived in. Um, and uh, but anyways, that's kind of what people were attached to. Nationalism changed the game. You know, now, now people are tied to, they're rallying around, they're unifying around, um, you know, a country now, right? Or an empire, right? Something much bigger uh, than that. And so uh, that's kind of the one thing you, I think is really vital for students to understand. And of course, French Revolution, post-French Revolution, great time uh, to understand how nationalism kind of weaves its way into that. That's kind of what we just mentioned, anyway. So would you be Mr. Farrell of Lake Worth? Uh, well, that's the high school I went to, but I didn't live in Lake Worth. So what would you be? I, I migrated all around Palm Beach County. Tim Migrate. Uh-huh. <laughs> Tim of West Palm Beach, mostly. That's some Tim immigration actually, that's going on there. I was actually uh, born in West Palm Beach. I lived most of my life in West Palm Beach. Not to be confused with Palm Beach, which is where all the rich people live. Gotcha. Gotcha. So for nationalism, uh, I stole Mr. Farrell's awesome assignment of kind of giving the kids an idea of how to associate nationalism with their own ideals of, of loving America and why we're America. And... So he had this awesome assignment that I stole and we did where I had all the pictures. And at the very end, I was like, so what is it you make these make you feel prideful of America? And I kind of associated being prideful of their countries with nationalism. And I think that made a really good connection of what is something that you were prideful in of your country, or as Mr. Farrell said, something that can rally you behind your country as a whole. And, uh, a couple of, you know, the examples, you know, the World War II champs and stuff like that. And we ranked, you know, freeing the slaves and the creation of our country. And uh, I, I thought that was a really good assignment that I think the kids can use as a personal representation of what nationalism means to them specifically for the United States. And then they can use that to represent nationalism for France and eventually Germany and, and the USSR, Italy, so on and so forth. Yeah, for us in America, we refer to this as patriotism. I mean, that's what this, that's what patriotism is. It's na it's American nationalism. Yeah. So I wanted to throw that in there too. Yeah, that's great. Good, good. I forgot about that. All right. No, I, well, we're, that's why the three of us are here. I think one of the things too that I, uh, that, that I find my students struggle with is they get, there's a lot of ideologies that come out of period three, uh, whether it's nationalism, imperialism, social Darwinism, 
communism, capitalism, socialism, all of these sorts of things. And uh, the, the, getting it, I can see tax traders getting confused pretty easily on this. And so uh, I would also look to them uh, to try and clarify and uh, differentiate among them. And, and also see the overlap that maybe nationalism would have with something like imperialism or whatever. Well, I got a dog barking, so I'm going to move us on to 47, and I don't know where Farrell went. Oh, there he is. I'm here. I'm going to go let the dog out. And Ooh, let the dog out. Be right back. Mullet. Mullet. Mr. Mullet. All right, well, I guess we can do this without him, right? Yeah. Yeah, go okay. Ahead. So opium wars. Uh, all right, so opium wars, uh, when he clicks on it, he's money, like – Money, money, money. It should be period three. Yeah. Um, and again, opium wars is something that my students seem to really understand. Uh, they really seem to, it seemed to, yeah. Um, but uh, so opium wars, uh, basically uh, you have a Britain who for years and years and years, I tried to find something that the Chinese will trade them for. Um, and uh, finally the British discover drugs. And uh, so what they start doing is uh, they become essentially the suppliers uh, and the, they, they, they tap India uh, to create the stuff. Uh, so they'll, India will, will create opium. Uh, the British will sell the opium to the Chinese. And uh, ultimately, uh, the Chinese government, they're not all about this opium. They see that it is slowing down production. It is crushing them economically. Um, imagine that people that are high on something that slows their system down they're they're not really working much uh, this is why drugs are not a good thing for production and especially this kind of drug and, uh, and uh, so um, essentially um, the, uh, the 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 Chinese government tries to shut it down they go to the British like please stop selling this stuff and the British are like sorry this is way too much of a lucrative business for us to stop shutting down and um, Long story short, opium wars are fought. The British literally sent gunships uh, into China. And uh, the Chinese were very quickly to raise the white flag. We give up. What can we do? Let's stop these wars. And the, uh, the British uh, will then uh, get them to sign what we call un unequal treaties. Of course, the most famous one being the Treaty of Nanking or Nanjing. Um, and this is ultimately going to give the British... Uh, um, basically exclusivity uh, in trade. It's going to allow them to really control uh, the Chinese economy for the first time in history. Somebody's able to do that. Uh, and uh, then now, and I understand this, this is what I got into with my students. This is not colonization. The British are not going to go in and colonize China. That is not the form of imperialism that is happening here. That form is going on in Africa. The British do not colonize China. Um, so it's, we call this a sphere of influence. That's the form of, of control that is happening here uh, in regards to imperialism. Um, so I wanted to make sure st uh, you know, students understood that. Of course, this is going to bring a lot of Europeans, especially British, into China. The Chinese aren't going to like this. They're going to try to resist this through the uh, Qing Rebellion and then, of course, most notably the Box Rebellion in uh, 1899. Um, so that's what I had to say. I think you got it all. Did I? Yeah. Cool. All right. Let's move. All right. Good job with the opium wars. Yes. In my class, you know, my kids, they, you know, we, we had, this was something that was pretty fresh in their heads uh, before we, uh, we went on spring break. So uh, yeah. it's a great, it's a great um, point of emphasis and a great piece of evidence. If you're looking to, to really explain, you know, European imperialism, it's really kind of an earlier form of it. If you're looking for the decline of the Qing dynasty uh, or the decline of China as a as a regional and global power, you know uh, it's what it, it's just a it's a a, a great uh, testimonial to a lot of the shifts and, and transitions that are happening during this period of time. All right, onward to 48. The Ottoman Empire begins. And that is period two, 1450 to 1750. Uh, one of the things that I, I look at as far as the, uh, the beginning of the Ottoman Empire is concerned is, is this is, the, you know, Turkish people do not uh, just appear out of thin air in 1450 or around 1450. Uh, that there had been, you know, several uh, Turkish states that had, had long been established and there had been some Turkish migrations. 
that have already been happening out of Central Asia, and many of them are, are heading different directions. They're heading to, to Southwest Asia and ultimately to uh, Turkey, where uh, you know their 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 new settled uh, location would be. Some of them are actually heading a different direction. Some of them are heading south into northern India and, and parts of uh, northern India and southern Afghanistan and other parts of, of South and Central Asia. Um, but one of the, the key events that I always think about with the Ottoman Empire is uh, the uh, takeover of the Ottoman Turks in the city of Constantinople, that its rise is at the uh, demise of the Byzantine Empire, which of course is one of our pre-1450 uh, civilizations. So uh, that's what I always think of with the Ottoman Empire. I, I also look at the, the beginning of the Ottoman Empire as you know one of the key things in, in AP world is looking at the emergence of new elites, of new elites. You know, the Turks are going to displace the Arabs as the leaders of the Islamic world. The Turks are going to displace, and, and specifically the Ottoman Turks, are going to displace that large and and and, and lucrative, uh, uh, long you know long standing Christian empire called the Byzantine Empire. Uh, you know they they will replace uh, Arab and Byzantine leadership and really become one of the new elites of this period of time. It's one of our six land based empires. Uh, calling it a land based empire is is could be debatable because uh, by the 1500s, you know the Ottomans were known for having their the, the first of the of their navies, one of the larger navies in the region, uh, and they continued to cross, uh, you know, parts of the Mediterranean, and of course, controlled all of the Black Sea. They they would ultimately control about fifty percent of the Mediterranean Sea as well. In a time uh, when you know European maritime empires are really knocking on their back door, and so uh, the Ottoman Empire is just such a crucial, crucial uh, empire that we need to understand uh, about itself so that we can understand how it relates to so many other things that are happening in the world uh, at this time. I'm not sure if Mr. Farrell accidentally got off of the, the meeting uh, or maybe he, he comes just back. messaged and said that uh, his computer shut down, he had to reboot. So keep going and uh, he'll pick back up with us in a minute. Okay, um, but those are the main things that I, that I think kids need to know about the beginning of the Ottoman Empire. Was there anything that you wanted to add to this? Um, I guess uh, one of the things that I remember teaching about was a little bit about their literature and technology and that the reason we have a lot of the information we have, again, that's something always so important as a historian with a capital H, is how do we know all of this? And the Ottoman Empire are going to build these very vast um, uh, architectural libraries and they're going to you know, be absorbing lots of information and mathematics and science and they are kind of the keepers of the knowledge for this time period until it eventually moves and transitions over fully into Europe. And I think that's kind of important to know because a lot of times when we focus on these land-based and gun-based empires, we talk about trade, 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 but we forget about a few of the other things like that that are they're instrumental in moving history forward. Uh, and the Ottoman Empire is an empire that is crucial for housing information and knowledge that will be uh, vital for the movement of the Industrial Revolution and globalization of trade and colonization uh, within the end of the 15th century. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. The Ottoman Empire is one of my, one of my favorite empires to teach about, one of my favorite empires to learn about when I was a, a student of history exactly. myself. So, hey, Mr. Farrell, you're back. Did you want to chime in? Uh, anything that you thought, maybe a parting shot on the Ottoman Empire? I don't know what you guys have said, because yeah, for whatever sorry. reason, my computer just shut off. So I have no you idea. You talked about how it wasn't really an important empire and didn't really do much in history. And <laughs> most kids have never heard of it. They really don't need to really understand it or anything. Yeah, I mean, it's a gunpowder empire. Uh, I'm just thinking about big things here, uh, which I'm sure you guys covered. Uh, oh. But uh, this is one of the greatest empires in history. Um, so, uh, Mr. Millette and I used to give a, uh, this is before IMSA or Mr. Kasky has already joined us. Uh, and, uh, but one of the things that we used to give was a, uh, an empire's assignment, uh, the list of the 10 greatest empires in history. And, uh, they, they, I interviewed tons of professors and, you know, incredible historians and they, and basically they came to the conclusion that the Ottoman empire was the greatest. Uh, now, what constitutes the greatest? Um, well, one of the things that went into that is uh, the durability of the empire. And uh, there's probably not a better, more durable empire than the Ottoman Empire. 
um, you know, uh, starts, you know, in the 1400s, lasts until the 1900s. I mean, it's the last true land-based empire left, um, you know, by the time World War I rolls around. So a very, very powerful empire, incredible navy through the use of, uh, which I'm sure you guys talked about. It's probably a Janissary Corps, you know, having a real strong. Actually, we didn't bring up the Janissaries. That's good. Oh, did you not? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, it, it basically recruiting young boys, uh, making them uh, Islamic or converting them to Islam, but also uh, they're able to, uh, they're kind of able to kill two birds with one stone. They're able to raise. Sorry, more PETA people. He didn't mean that. Sorry, yeah. Um, anyways. Uh, but they're also able to uh, raise a, a large military that way. So, um, yeah, uh, that's the things that I think of with the Ottoman Empire uh, for, you know, the first couple hundred years. I mean, militarily, nobody could touch them. Um, also, uh, science, intellectually, for the first, you know, part of their empire, nobody was more, you know, intellectual. As far as we talked about that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, and now, obviously, you know, they experience a severe decline. Uh, and I think we've mentioned that before, uh, due to nationalism is going to crush this empire. Uh, then, you know, they, they attempt to reform the Tanzimat reforms, but simply the religious conservatives just were, were too powerful of a force in the Ottoman Empire. And uh, then by the time World War One rolls around, that was, that was it, 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 it's death toll there. Uh, that was, that was the it, that was it for them. Um, so um, anyway. Yeah. All right. All right. Looking good. Ottoman Empire. Let's go on to 49. Uh, the Portuguese establishing trading posts in the Indian Ocean. I feel like right. my students may have written something about this. Yeah, I was going to say. you guys have students write something about this? I don't remember. I Maybe we did. I can't remember. You yeah, remember. Uh, I, I was going to say. Uh, I'm an historian. I don't I don't have good memory. Yeah, this was uh, last year's DBQ on the on the exam. Unfortunately, that might not happen this year. Um, but anyway, uh, but yeah, so uh, my goodness, I mean, my students should be able to uh, really talk a lot about this. Um, but uh, so the Portuguese, um, you know, very, very small uh, little uh, country in Europe there. Uh, but um, they were able to um, really, they were the first to uh, European uh, country to uh, start exploring. Uh, they'll start with Prince Henry the Navigator, explore the African coast, and then uh, ultimately, you know, they'll they'll make their way into the to the Western Hemisphere, uh, colonize Brazil. Uh, but where they're kind of most known for, I think, is their involvement in the Indian Ocean, and uh, they're going to establish trading posts. Guys like Afonso de Albuquerque are going to establish kind of this idea. Um, you know, once Vasco da Gama establishes a presence in India, boy, the Portuguese just pour into it because they see how much money they can make there in the Indian Ocean. Uh, but they'll establish trading posts um, throughout uh, the Indian Ocean, um, in some cases colonies uh, along the African coast. Um, and, uh, you know, they're setting up markets. They're doing exactly what they were, want, were trying to do is establishing markets overseas. And they do that. Uh, and they led... Uh, the way for the, the first probably 100 years they, they led uh, these these trading posts and, 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 and their as far as the presence goes they probably had the greatest presence in, in, in Indian Ocean for the first hundred years now the problem is being very small they couldn't keep that up and um, it had difficulty uh, managing uh, their empire overseas go ahead that's when we wrote the DBQ uh, I really liked my kids that tried to take the standpoint that they were not all that important and they were very, very minimal. Uh, their trading posts, there were very few of them. Uh, they were very restricted in what they could trade. They didn't make a lot of money off of what they were trading and stuff uh, because the, the, the locals were screwing them uh, and uh, they were you know, manipulating them. And, and when we wrote the DBQ, I thought the kids used a lot of uh, great outside sources uh, trying to make some arguments of, against how uh, influential the Portuguese are here, although they're the first and they may establish, um, they were very minimal uh, and they're the other countries, you know, in Spain and, and uh, the others, Dutch in particular, get in here, they're gonna be much more influential and really shape the landscape of the Indian trade uh, more so than the Portuguese. So yeah, establishing is important, but I really liked how my kids argued against uh, the exclusivity of the Portuguese and that they were the end all be all. That's that's yeah. kind of how we went with the DBQ. Yeah, that that's that's a great a great thing, and and quite frankly, 
uh, a lot of kids can can almost work on getting you know complexity points if they if they're uh, coming up with with you know arguments like that and extending their arguments like that. The uh, yeah, and and, to, and more to your point, you know, as much as the Portuguese are you know the first of the Europeans to get direct access into uh, the Indian Ocean trade. Uh, that does not negate, uh, you know, the the Islamic presence that is there. Uh, that did not uh, negate, you know, the the Indian uh, uh, presence that was still there. That did not negate the Indonesian presence that is still there. And yeah, you know, the 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 Portuguese will displace some smaller, uh, you know, unattached states like they get the the Sultan of Malacca. That you know, they'll they'll take that over. Uh, some of the Swahili states on the east coast of Africa, they'll take them over. But, you know, while the, the while this is happening, there's still the 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 presence of the Mughal Empire is, is going to be there and and the Safavid Empire is going to be there and, and the Safavids will move into the southern portion of Iran and, and the Portuguese will have a run in with them as well. Uh, the Ottomans, the Ottomans are there. I mean, what we can't do is negate the continued presence of Indian and Islamic uh, states and uh, you know merchants uh, that were still thriving, still prospering, and though many of them saw the Portuguese as a threat, um, and and that was you know evident in the documents that we looked at, uh, it was still uh, you know they were still very much present you know, uh, so yeah, uh, in a lot of ways the Portuguese were just one more uh, added to that. So yeah. Kind of, I, 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 I think it's good to understand, though, that like they were the they really were the first European uh, uh, country to, or, and eventually empire to, to to start to fly the waters of, of the Indian Ocean. So I think that that's kind of what they needed. But you know, you're right. I mean, the, the Ottoman Empire, Mughal, still a huge presence there in the Indian Ocean. However, the Portuguese are the first. They're gonna gonna start a trend, though. Yeah, I think I, I remember one of my kids, they wrote, I can't remember who it was or how they worded it. Basically, they said that this was the training wheels uh, mm -hmm. version of them going to the Americas. Yeah. And, and, and where they tried and they saw their failures and their successes. And then they not only replicate it, but they improve upon it, you know, in the, in the 16th century, when they finally, you know, find the Americas and start to expand in, you know, throughout the Americas. So. Yeah. All right, good stuff. Are we good on this one? Biddy. Biddy. Potosi silver mines opened in Bolivia and Peru. I didn't teach this at all. <laughs> I don't even know what silver is. Well, I don't know that you have to necessarily know the Potosi silver mines, but I think the key thing here is the fact that silver is uh, largely one of those things that, the, especially the Spanish, uh, are going to take from the Americas and bring with them to uh, to places that didn't maybe have as much abundance of silver as they wanted, aka the Chinese. Um, and so this is all part of that whole Manila galleon trade, uh, or trade across the Pacific. You know, earlier we talked about trade across the Atlantic and how important that was, right? Well, silver. I should. Here's a good a good analogy I'm making on the spot. I've never done this, but this rough top of my head. Uh, sugar, I would say, is to the Atlantic Ocean as silver is to the Pacific Ocean. Would you guys agree with that? I yeah, that's a good way to look at the trade routes. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of why I think this, this uh, should be included um, because those, those Manila Galleon trades were really uh, vital, especially with the Spanish. I mean, that's a big reason why they took the Philippines, you know, so they had a place that the Chinese would come and trade them with. Because remember, the Chinese, they've traded their, their, trade, their, their, uh, their, their coastal ports. They're like, no, we don't want you guys here. However, we are willing to go somewhere else to trade with you guys. We don't want you trading in, in, in our front yard here, but we'll go down the street and trade with you guys. Um, and uh, so our kids don't see. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so um, that's kind of what I think the kids need to know about this. Also, the fact that they use uh, a lot of native labor for this. This is pretty brutal labor. Uh, that they're going to use here um, uh, within these silver mines. Uh, so, but yeah, they're in, in South America. Um, so often we get caught up on the, on the sugar plantation, the Engino in Brazil, but this is really important too. Uh, a huge, huge lucrative uh, uh, money-making uh, deal for especially the Spanish. I think one yeah. of the things 
is influential here is especially in Bolivia uh, is the change in their society and their social structures of of the Spanish coming in and changing their their clothes, changing you know uh, their their lives are up, upended and they, they have to completely revamp their society as a result because of the need or want desire for silver. And like you said, we always focus on, on some of these things. And I always say the three G's, right? Gold is always one of the huge ones. And sometimes we forget how valuable and how many billions of dollars worth of silver was pulled out of the new world and taken uh, across the oceans as well. Yeah, I I teach that uh, you know the the silver trade is 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 such a important uh, element in this period of time. You know, I, I like the comparison you make with the sugar trade, um, you know, yeah. and, and its importance I mean, across the Pacific. Trade. But like when you when you think about um, the the period of time this is happening, uh, this is a period of time where you know the Europeans are trying to get access to Asia. They're trying to get access to China and India, you know, specifically in Asia. And in spite of the fact that the Americas are, are going to be, quote unquote, discovered uh, in a European sense, and it's going to be very beneficial to Europeans economically and, and productively and all that, uh, the harsh reality is uh, the Spanish still wanted to get into contact uh, with those Far Eastern states uh, like the Chinese. And this was their key. This was their key, uh to, to, to get into that marketplace. And that's why they were able to do what they did from the Philippines where they had colonized and be able to trade with the, uh, you know, the Chinese there in close proximity from the Philippines. Um, very few things uh, opened China up during this period of time. China was very uh, dismissive to foreign culture and foreign uh, you know, merchants coming in, they were very restrictive and uh, like to keep them at, uh, at bay, quite literally, uh, and not let them uh, really have more than just a few ports in the South. But uh, if you think of the things that have been able to open China up, uh, this is one of them. And it was the, uh, the silver trade. And if, it, if not for the abundance of silver available uh, to the Spanish colonial empire, uh, that might not have happened as it did. Uh, during this period of time. So yeah, it's it, it's more than just uh, the ramifications that we have on the Americas, the ramifications that we have on global trade, on global interactions, on global exchanges, such an important element in this period of time. Yeah, it's part of that Colombian exchange I think we sometimes forget about. Yeah. Anything else on number uh, 50? I'm good. good. All right, let's move ahead. And we, oh, look at that, back to praying. Somebody go ahead and start with we, we've something kind of, to drink. Yeah, we've kind of uh, – don't drink that orange juice, by the way. Mr. Kasky says it's bad for you. Yeah. Lots of sugar. Lots of sugar. Uh, so we hey, have talked about printing a little bit. Of, point four and I can't get under 200. I can't crack it. Stop um, drinking right. orange juice. The orange juice, man. Yeah. Uh, it also might be the huge birthday cake you keep eating. <laughs> Cupcakes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and it, well, my, my daughter has a birthday on Saturday, and then my wife's is next Saturday. So Happy like, birthday, I'm, Pippa. I'm going to be eating. Oh, you hear that? Yeah, she heard that. She's like, oh, I heard that. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, I'll be eating tons of birthday cake the next week and a half. Uh, anyways, um, but uh, we talked about printing a little bit um, when we were talking about the printing press and how this is invented kind of in China. So this is very much a pre-1450 idea. Um, you know, the Chinese in many ways were the first to invent a lot of some of the most important things that, that we still use today. Uh, and uh, printing is certainly one of those things. Um, now, did they invent a printing press? No. Uh, but the idea behind printing was invented by them. And uh, so obviously, uh, that's going to lead to, you know, the ability to, to produce massive amounts of literature um, and uh, so you have a very literate society in China, in many ways more literate than just about anywhere else in the world pre-1450. Pre, you know, uh, so um, I don't know what more to talk about other than what we already did. Yeah, I mean, this ranks up there with some of the greatest inventions ever. I mean, this, again, is world-changing. Uh, you're doing this for economic reasons. Now you can have, you know, more uh, succinct 
receipts for trading. Um, this is going to allow you to record information better. This is going to transfer. I mean, they're one of the first societies that transfer away from an oral history to a written history. That's why we know all of these things. The obviously the long term ramifications of uh, printed money, so no longer coin money. That is really going to change the game for yeah. uh, trade. The barter system, you know, goes away over, of course, millennia. But still, it has to start somewhere. Uh, and then you have the, the Chinese were doing amazing things with paper. They were creating walls. They were creating umbrellas. They were creating shoes. And so their their use of paper is just incredible. And one of the longest term ramifications, of course, is going to be printing and recording of information, transfer of information. Yeah, agreed. All right, did, I think we can we, move. Did we talk about how unimportant printing was in China? Yep. 52. <laughs> how it did nothing uh, intellectually or economically or Correct. any, yep. okay. We skipped all that. Tell you, I don't even know why I included They weren't drinking guys. orange juice. Yeah. Hey man, does it's that bad. look orange to you? Looks like tea. Looks like tea. Yeah, it's green tea. That doesn't look green to me. That's got blueberry in it. It's uh, five calories per serving. Sounds that's probably, terrible. That's probably two servings. That's actually really good. Yeah. That's that's my soda. 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 That's pop. So sody pop. That's my sody pop. All right. All right, Coach Clutter. 52. The Qing Empire established. Well, I, I keep coming back to these land-based empires that we uh, – uh, that we learned about in my class, and the Qing Empire was one of those. It's actually going to get its start in the middle of the 1600s, 1644, I think, to be exact, is when the dynasty is going to be founded. But uh, this one's interesting, being in China, is that the Qing dynasty wasn't actually founded by native Chinese family or a native Chinese uh, movement. Uh, the Qing were actually uh, established after the arrival of the Manchu, the Manchu warriors that had come in and had uh, seized control of the city of Beijing. For those of you that don't know your geography of East Asia, Manchuria is just a bit north of the Korean Peninsula. And so it is north of China and north of Korea. Uh, it actually, uh, what was once known as Manchuria is in part in Russia and in part uh, in China today. And so the Manchu, this is a Manchu dynasty, the Qing. Uh, and um, just because they were Manchu didn't mean that they did not take on some of the characteristics of the Chinese subjects that they uh, were now uh, in control of. But uh, a lot of kids that, you know, they, they kind of miss that, that little element of this is that this is not a native Chinese uh, dynasty, that it is in fact uh, another period of time where the Chinese are governed uh, by someone or a group of people that uh, comes from outside of China. So, uh, the Qing being established, uh, they carry on the tradition of uh, the dynasty. They carry on the tradition of, of China being a land-based empire. And quite frankly, they've got the daunting task of dealing with the arrival of Europeans uh, in China, and especially in southern China, is this Qing dynasty. What do you guys think kids need to know about the Qing dynasty? i got to let a dog out. Uh, uh, real quick, I think one of the key things is they will be the dynasty that loses uh, – Taiwan, Vietnam, Korea, because the Chinese had kind of loosely controlled those areas for so long. And under the Qing dynasty, they're going to lose those and they're going to become independent nations, which are going to have long term ramifications with the Japanese, which is going to, you know, start to have all these countries become so isolated. They're going to self isolate as a result. And I, I think that the Qing empire, while an empire in itself is, is almost weakening Asia as a whole. Yeah, um, you know they're they're gonna try to bring back a lot of the same traditions that that a lot of Chinese empires have tried to create. Uh, you know they'll continue with the civil service exam. They'll they'll continue to make Confucianism kind of the dominating ideology as well. Um, but uh, yeah, what was interesting? What's interesting about the Qing Dynasty is here you have you know, the, the the dynasty before this was the Ming Dynasty, and the Ming Dynasty is all about Oh, yeah, ensuring the that the foreigners don't, you know, uh, harm their culture. Yeah. And what happens? The foreigners come in and <laughs> they harm their culture. So, um, you know, as far as Qing Empire goes, uh, hold on one sec. Hey, guys. Yeah, and this is where you had said before about the silver, where the British are getting their 
you're going to get eventually their spheres of influence here. And just because the Qing Empire is established here, it actually goes into period three. And that's who the British are dealing with is the remnants of the Qing Empire. Right. Uh, they're trying to build the railroads there. You have the introduction of the silver. So this is kind of, this is the empire that really we're talking about when we say China in period three, this is the empire we're referring to. Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah I mean, I this is the last that dynasty. Complexity. Yeah, this is the last dynasty, uh, you know, and that's- like last great dynasty, yeah. Yeah, last, yeah, last great, it, so, I mean- Before they fall to communism, turn to communism? <laughs> before, they, yeah, before they turn to communism, yeah. All right, you guys so, good on 52? Yes. Yep. All right, I, I, the dog is outside, I'll be right back. Here's uh, 50. I wouldn't understand, I don't have dogs. You wouldn't understand, Farrell, you don't, you don't have pets. The reign it's of Louis the Fourteenth absolutism. Uh, uh, I'll let you guys tackle this one for a minute, and then I'll be right back. But uh, what a big deal he is in Euro. What do you think kids need to know about him as far as world history is concerned? All right, so Louis the Fourteenth. He is an, the best example we have of what's called absolutism or absolute monarchy or divine right he's also going to uh, employ. Uh, so I will start kind of from the beginning. So pre-1450, you have medieval Europe, you have, you know, the lords, you have all of that. They're controlling the countryside. You've got the knights and the serfs and all of that. The feudal contract, all of that, right? So uh, crusades happen, uh, all these other, black death happens, all these other things happen. Feudalism ends up dying out. And so monarchs start to assume more and more control, right? Uh, and so we get into the... Um, the, the 15 and 1600s, this right in the meat of this time period, and monarchs are now asserting their authority authority more than ever, uh, to the point where they are starting to, to assume control over many aspects of European life. The best example, and this is the pretty much the only one I really gave with my kids. So of course, if it was a European history class, I would have, you know, we would have talked about this a lot more. But Louis is the best example. In fact, uh, you know, referred to as the Sun King. Because uh, that's how much he thought of himself, and that's how much he wanted the people to think of him. He felt that life revolved around him, essentially. Uh, so his biggest problem, though, is he's, it's not the people necessarily, the mass of people, it's the nobility. He's got to control the nobility, those lords, right? So how does he do it? Well, he does it a few ways, but my favorite way that he controls the nobility, builds the Palace of Versailles. Uh, essentially, the idea is he'll bring in the nobles, entertain them, Keep them out of political affairs, uh, feed them. And to be honest with you, somebody, you know, brings me and feeds me, gives me a nice place to stay and hang out in beautiful, luscious gardens to visit. You've got me. <laughs> so, uh, and that's exactly what he does. And he's able to kind of control the, the masses, uh, control the nobility. And through that, I mean, this guy is going to be able to wheel and deal and control almost, you know, his entire, uh, what will become his, an empire uh, underneath him. Um, and so he starts this whole absolute monarchy. Now, the other thing he's going to do is he's going to use religion to kind of legitimize his rule through what we call divine right. He's basically going to say, hey, uh, God, put me in this position. And if you don't agree with this, that means you don't agree with God. And uh, so um, this is something also that, you know, monarchs in Europe are going, not all, but some monarchs are going to employ. So this becomes a really big movement in Europe uh, during period two is this idea of absolute rule. Of course, this will be an issue once enlightenment thought comes around. This is what enlightenment thought is gonna kind of attack is absolute rule. So anyway, that yeah, was this my is a nice, Yeah, th I think this is kind of like a nice bookend. Uh, so you have uh, Tsar Nicholas II as kind of the last true absolutism mark in Russia. Uh, and then you have Louis kind of you could say not the first, but, but he's a nice bookend to put to history of saying, all right, if you're looking at the, the, the time frame of absolute mark monarchies, you have Louis here at the beginning ish and you have Nicholas the second at the end ish. Yeah. And I like to look at someone like Louis in, in my world history class with uh, a comparative lens, you know, just, just, just as much as he did the divine right and used religion or ideology to, um, reassert his power, legitimize his power, just as much as he used the, the finances of the state uh, to show off and showcase his strength with the building of the Palace of Versailles. So many other emperors outside of Europe did things that were paralleling this. Uh, you, you have it with the Ottoman sultans. You know, they, they have 
uh, Islam and, and they see themselves as the, the, the leader of the Islamic world. Uh, they have the, uh, you know, amazing architecture and the large mosques and large palaces there in Istanbul. You see it with the Mughal. The Mughal did the same thing uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, some of the beautiful palaces and mosques that were in the Safavid Empire uh, built during the 17th century there. Uh, even the Ming and the Qing uh, leaders, you know, at the same time uh, where, where Louis and other European monarchs are, are doing these things, these other places have leaders that are consolidating their power, that are showcasing, showcasing their strength, that are utilizing religion and ideology to the betterment of their control, to the, to the uh, benefit of their state, and, and to ensure political and social stability in these places. Um, I, I like to look at the parallels uh, that, that Louis has with others uh, in different places, but at the same time. That's good. All Thanks. right. Good on 53? Yeah. All right. Onward to 54. I got to move you all out of the way. You're in the way. Suleiman. And yeah, this is the reign of Suleiman the Magnificent. Hey, talking about somebody that uh, utilized religion, utilized uh, art and architecture, utilized their military, and were able to, in many ways, um, keep their biggest critics close. I think uh, Suleiman the Magnificent and Louis XIV uh, ha have a lot in common. As much as they might have different differences between the two, they, they may also have a lot of similarities in a world history standpoint. We all think we need to have our students understand about the reign of Suleiman the Magnificent. Um, I'll just give kind of a big overall thing and then you guys can you know, fill in the gaps. Uh, rule of Suleiman. So obviously, this is an Ottoman ruler, right? That wasn't mentioned yet. Uh, he is probably the greatest of all Ottoman rulers. This is uh, during a time. By the way, you didn't put the period down. Should be period two, though. Uh, this is uh, during a time uh, where the Ottoman Empire is at its strongest, man. Uh, and he's gonna he's gonna expand the borders. Um, he is going to implement. Um, uh, some policies that that are going to strengthen the Ottoman Empire. I mean, this is when the Ottoman Empire is at its greatest. This is under the reign of, of Suleiman the Magnificent. Uh, he's going to expand his own powers, as uh, Mr. Millet kind of said. Uh, he was an absolute ruler, much like Louis. Uh, what he said went the way it was going to be. Um, so, uh, da 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 da. Um, yeah, that's kind of what all I got. Yeah, you can look through him going through and, and just the campaigns of conquest through the early 1500s there is, is really setting the bar for the Ottoman Empire and it, it establishing them, as you said, as possibly, arguably, definitely arguably, as one of the greatest empires of all time as he, you know, consolidates his power around the Middle East and uh, Western or Eastern Europe. Yeah, I, I like to, again, I come back to the whole Ottoman Empire, and, and Suleiman truly was, uh, you know, that, that emperor, that sultan that put, uh, you know, that put the Ottoman Empire where, you know, to the height that it would reach. But, Literally on uh, the map. Yeah, um, but, I, but I think that um, one thing I like to teach my kids about this is, uh, you know, while European, you know, a lot of kids, they have this misconception that Europe is just controlling the world between 1450 and 1750. And they've got everybody under their control. Uh, well, this was an empire right on their back door that they didn't want to mess with, that they didn't want to deal with. You, you ask, uh, if we were to travel back in time to the 16th century and ask the Habsburgs that ruled out of Vienna, Austria, uh, what their biggest uh, fear was, their biggest fear was the Ottoman Empire. Their biggest fear was Suleiman. Their biggest fear was, uh, you know, the them them coming in and 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 laying siege to the city of Vienna. Uh, while you have Europe is on the rise at this point in time, uh, this land-based, which is a debatable term really, and sea-based empire of the Ottoman Empire is one that, that the Europeans really don't know how to uh, deal with exactly, uh, especially those in the eastern part of Europe. Uh, so when I look at the reign of Suleiman, uh, I, I, I rank him and uh, the Ottoman Empire right there up uh, with them being as powerful, if not more powerful, uh, than a lot of your developing 
European maritime-based empires that, that were so important in our uh, study of world history. Yeah, um, you're frozen, Millette. I, I, He's frozen on yours, Kasky. All right, now you guys are frozen. frozen. Okay, no, I was going to come back. That's a purposeful look there. <laughs> he did it before. Second. He did it really good, too. Yeah, and I wish I was. I, w I wish I was faking it, but I'm not faking it. <laughs> All right, um, we're back. I was we're not working that one. Yeah. Yeah, what I was going to say. <laughs> gotcha. What, what I was going to say was. Um, What's funny uh, is you, I can still hear you guys. You guys only freeze for like a second when mine comes back on. Yeah. Anyway, uh, what I was going to say is you talked <laughs> about how powerful this uh, this empire was. And, um uh, geez, I mean, think about how large it is, too. I mean, physical land. I mean, the amount of land and the amount of ethnicities that this man is controlling. You remember, I mean, the Ottoman Empire is not just the Middle East. I mean, the Ottoman Empire at this point is extending down into Egypt, over into uh, the Lib will be Libya and Northern Africa, up into all the way to the Balkan region in Europe. I mean, there are all kinds of ethnicities and cultures and types of people that he's got to appease. He's got to control, too, in the same token. And the fact that they were able to do this for 500, well, almost 500 years, is just phenomenal. And Suleiman is the guy that's ruling this when it's at its height. It's at its greatest. Um, and uh, definitely something to be said for that. So. All right. Shall we move on to 55? Yeah. Last one. Is everybody ready for 55? Last one. All right. The reign of the Abbasid Caliphate. All right. So my students struggled with this. A lot of them were like, I don't even remember the Abbasid. And, yeah. uh, and I told them that's because it was one of the first things we learned about this year, you know. Um, the, uh, so the Abbasid Caliphate, it really all starts with understanding Islam. Uh, you know, Islam is established in the 7th century CE, and, um, and, and, and Islamic empires will form shortly after that. Of course, the first you had was the Umayyad Empire, and they didn't last very long because they tried to just go around and tell everybody what to do instead of really truly ruling like an empire should. Um, and so the Abbasid Empire is actually going to overthrow the Umayyad Empire, and the Abbasid Empire is going to establish a presence in uh, the Middle East uh, for the next several hundred years. Um, so this is one of our first empires that I know my class learned about. Um, and uh, this is an Islamic empire, a very Islamic empire. By the way, it is Sunni Islam, that form of, uh, uh, of Islam. But anyways, uh, but yeah, so this is um, an Islamic empire. Uh, it, it will last until the Turks start coming around, uh, and they'll start um, uh, putting a lot of controls and clamps on this empire. The empire uh, will continue to run, but really, truly, it was being run by the, uh, the Seljuk Turks for a long time. Uh, leading up to 1450, um, but uh, these this was a powerful empire for a long time. They did a great job of administering their empire. Uh, their empire stretched basically about as far, almost as far as the Ottoman Empire did. Um, you know, into northern Africa, you know, down down throughout the Middle East, um, and even parts of, of of far reaches of Europe. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, a lot of places that Islam is going to spread to. Um, the Abbasid Caliphate has a lot to do with that. Now, notice it is called a caliphate because it's named after the caliph. The caliph was the leader of the empire and, and ultimately uh, the world of Islam. Uh, caliph means deputy. So uh, he's kind of the deputy of the empire. Uh, so uh, definitely one of our first Islamic empires that we see. That's kind of one of the things that you guys need to know. So this is very much an early Islamic empire. Yeah, this is the the golden age of Islam, as it's called. Yeah, and this is this is where they give uh, history, you know, zero through nine, and uh, this is where they create, you know, some of the early mathematics, and this is where they start to develop all of their great domes and architecture, and and build the the dome of the rock, and this is when all of that really starts to happen. This is the quintessential. Uh, Islamic, yeah, yeah. To, you guys are right. To me, this is the one that really sets the stage for what uh, Islamic empires uh, strive to be. In a lot of ways, it's what the Ottoman Empire even strived to be. Um, just to kind of hone in on some things too. I know, uh, you know, in in the pre fourteen fifty period, uh, the Abbasid Caliphate is going to 
come to an end in the middle of the 13th century. And it's like Mr. Farrell said, uh, it's got some issues with some Turkish groups that are moving in. And then in the year 1258, the city of Baghdad, which was their, their hub and their capital and, and their cultural uh, epicenter of this empire, uh, is actually going to be taken over by the Mongols. And so you have Turkish and Mongolian groups that are coming into the Middle East, and they're displacing the Abbasids. The Abbasids were uh, an Arab Muslim empire. And so, again, I come back to at the beginning of our course, they're almost on their way out while these new elites in the Turks and the Mongols are starting to really rise up. Uh, and by 1450, they'll have been displaced. But, uh, they're so important, really understanding the foundation for the golden age of Islam and really setting the bar for what Islamic empires uh, should really strive for. Uh, another cool thing about the Abbasids is you know, they, they, they alter their relationships with uh, the Christian societies. Uh, in a lot of ways, and, and those relationships bettered uh, from earlier times. You mentioned the Umayyad that preceded them, uh, relationships between Christians in Europe and, uh, you know, Umayyad uh, Arab Muslims were not too good. Uh, the Abbasids stabilized some of those relationships and allowed for cultural exchange and intellectual exchange and a lot more economic exchange. Uh, those relationships will worsen again with the with the coming of the Turks and, and kind of the rise of, of Europe. We'll see those uh, happen again, but, uh, you know, the, the Abbasids were really uh, such a magnificent and, and wealthy empire uh, that we could actually see Islamic and Christian uh, states coexist uh, with with each other, um, and, and there's a lot of, uh, of evidence to that with the Abbasids. Yeah, the, the one a good example there that they could use is the House of Wisdom was a place of scholarly yeah. Uh, you know, connection where Muslims and Christians were encouraged to come together and trade information. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, of course, yeah, that all come I mean, crashing down with the the Crusades. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. again, remember the Crusades too. The Crusades were less uh, issues between uh, Christian Europeans and 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 Arab Muslims, as it was more of an issue with Turkish Muslims. Yeah, uh, than than anything else. And so, uh, you know, that, that's why I pr I bring that up. Uh, a lot of kids, you know, they they'll that when we just say, well, they're Islamic, they're, they're like, well, what's different? You know, is there anything different about them ethnically or linguistically or, or nationally? And yes, there is. Be a Turk is not the same as being an Arab. And even though they might have a religion and even a, a sect of religion in, yeah. in Sunni Islam, that, that doesn't mean that they're the same people. And, and we see that, you know, with these empires that uh, those groups are so vital, really understanding relationships, diplomacy, and rivalry uh, within, you know, within and among uh, empires. So yeah, yes, Turks are not Arabs. Right. Different, <laughs> right? They might all be Islamic, yeah, uh, both be Islamic, but they are not the same people. So correct. All right. Well, right, folks, so. how, how are we feeling about this? Are we good? I'm yeah. good. We'll do twenty right. tomorrow. tomorrow. Last tomorrow we'll do the final twenty. We'll try and move through those quick. Uh, don't go anywhere, anybody. I'm going to stop the slide share. And, and also, months. just a reminder again, guys. Uh, ah, giant feral face. <laughs> what? Anyways, uh, just a remi reminder, you guys don't have to watch the whole video. You can fast forward to wherever you need to go to. You know, if you're like, oh, crap, the Abbasids, I don't remember them at all. You know, you can fast forward. But I know, I understand absolute monarchy, but Abbasids, I need. You just you know, fast forward to the end, um, you know. Uh, and again, if you guys have any questions or anything, email us. No, we can get back to you. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Now we're here for you guys. Um, you know, uh, hopefully you guys are all staying safe. All right. All right, everybody. I am going to uh, hit the stop button on this and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, folks.